Saturday, you've just got the whole week. You can just be footloose and fancy free. Just enjoy everybody. Watch the guys who are coming up to speak and think, oh, yeah, they're, they're worried about it, you know. And you think you got it all under control. And this morning I had uh, got up at, at 7 o'clock to hear Pastor West speak. And you know, last night I was working on my message a little bit. And West started reading the scriptures. And, uh, and this is what's going on in my head. Man, he's reading a lot of scriptures. What's I don't I wonder what Pastor Walgas was speaking next. Dan Walgas, I'm thinking, I wonder what Dan's gonna speak on. Man, he's getting into his verses. And I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking, man, I don't know. And, then, and I think, man, I got a lot of verses to deal with. And then I took my form out and realized that I had been studying some of the wrong verses. <laughs> You know, you think you're right and everybody else is wrong, and then you realize, no, I was wrong. And then I'm sitting there, you know, I was awake through your whole thing, Wes. I mean, I was on edge then. I mean, I'm, you know, no, no. And then, uh, to make matters worse, I had seven points. And I told Pastor Andy Kern, I said, I said, I told you what my seven points were a week and a half ago. Why didn't you tell me I had too many? He goes, I said, I'm going to have to knock it down to at least five. He goes, well, maybe that's just better for everybody. <laughs> so I fired him. So that was awesome. So uh, maybe it's just better for everybody. I, uh, I, as, of, as of March 1st, I took the role of uh, president of Green Bible Institute. And, and I don't think there's been a day gone by that I haven't uh, asked myself, what in the world have you done? And uh, just, you know, knowing that it's in the Lord's hands and it's His ministry and, and I want to be faithful to that. And then we'll take every day as it comes. Um, but your role changes. Your role changes from being an instructor that goes home and then you don't think about classes unless you have something to do necessarily. You go back to the office on Monday and you get ready. Now it's, you think about it all the time. And, and, I'll, I'll, and I'll honestly say I like that. I really appreciate the ministry of Green Bible Institute. Um, but one, two things that I've discovered, and one of them has to do with what we're going to talk about tonight. One is the appreciation for Dr. Bedore and Linda Bedore. Um, because I, I now, in that role, see all, from a different perspective, all of the work. For over 15 years that they have poured their heart into that ministry, and still do, by the way. And in all of the writing of... of uh, of handbooks and different things that, that uh, the structure of a school that it takes to run a school and, and the decision making that, that goes into that and the tough decisions that they have to make and, and I've appreciated that. The other one is this and it does, uh, it does deal with what we're going to be talking about tonight is um, I am blessed to also see how God uses members of the body of Christ to support that ministry. I made a statement the other night that we couldn't last a week without God's people giving. And I know I see uh, Pastor Ricky shaking his head because BBS is the same way. You just couldn't. And, and, and it's just, it's, it's just, it's humbling when you see uh, people giving to that ministry. And I don't know who they are. I've never met them before. And, and yet they see that as something important. And, and you just are humbled. I write up. I write a, a donor letter every month, um, part of my responsibilities now, and I actually really enjoy it. Uh, in that donor letter, I, I try to put in there um, uh, something, one or two things that's happening currently at the school, but I also try to convey to our, our donors that when they give, every time a teacher teaches, a light goes on, Every time uh, we enter the building, every time something happens there, every time a graduate gradu a, gra a, a student graduates, it's as a result of their partnership in the ministry. And you can say that about your local churches as well. I'm not just upholding BB BBI, but it happens at BBS, it happens in your local church. And we've got to understand that we're part of a bigger picture. Right. It's, 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 about, it's about the body of Christ coming together and, and supporting ministries and supporting each other and encouraging each other. And uh, it's, uh, it's, just, it's, it's to realize that we're part of something. And uh, we're part of something big. 
And God, God has a role for each and every one of us in that. And uh, take your Bibles and turn to the last chapter of Philippians. And uh, I'm going to actually read verses that weren't assigned to me because it's the last night and I can walk all over everybody. Um, but I'm just going to read these verses because they do, uh, I don't have seven points, I only have five, but they do give some, some background and they do apply. Um, at the end of the book, verse, verse 10, and we'll read to the end, and just follow along. It says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, now at, le at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned whatever state I am in to be content. I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek a gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus uh, the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus, the brethren who, who, the brethren who are uh, with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This morning, or this evening, what I want to do is, is, is look at my, my text, is 14, verse 14 to the end of the chapter, and look at five different principles that I think we can apply here from this text. And, and look at, actually, as, as the title of my message is, uh, the Philippians' example, and to see what they did. See how they responded to, uh, uh, to the, actually, to the leading of, of God, to the call of God on their lives. Sometimes we get we, we move beyond that. We look at what, what they did, the gift, but realize that there's something happening in their lives that's causing them and leading them to respond by faith. The first principle is this, found in verse 14. It says, nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. And I, I marry that with verse 10, and I'll go back and read that. It says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now is your, as, at last your care for me has flourished again. Uh, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. The first principle is simply this. God actively uses believers to encourage and support those involved in the work of God. I'll read it again. God actively uses believers to encourage and support those involved in the work of God, or His work. The context, of course, is Paul thinking that, uh, and thanking the Philippians for their ongoing sacrificial support. Their ongoing sacrificial support. In every, every commentary I've looked at when they said, what is the purpose, what is the theme of Philippians? One of them is a thank you letter for what they have done to the Apostle Paul. Their support of him, their encouragement of him, their financial giving to him. And, and people are weird when we talk about that. And, and I, think, I think that there doesn't, we don't need to be that way. We realize it's between us and God, and it's God leading to give. And God, gave, God used this church to give to Paul's ministry because of the work of God in their lives. And, and not, not manipulation, you know, not a TV ministry, but the work of God in their lives. And out of that, they wanted to support his ministry. A couple of things that I want to I kind of go back through the book of Philippians. Uh, now, now is when I get to go back and talk about what everybody else talked about. Um, I did learn something this week. Never go fishing with Ken. <laughs> or if you do, wear a helmet. <laughs> I like that. That was good. Um, or turn your back when, he, when he's pulling on something. 
But anyway, look, I just want to look at this. Look at 1-7. We're going to hop, skip, and jump through this, through this book. And uh, just, just notice, Paul viewed um, the Philippians as partners in his ministry. Partners in his ministry. Not just some church out there that happened to throw an offering his way, but he saw what he was doing in his ministry, um, a, an outreach of what they were doing. They were part of him. And just look at verse 7, and we'll read through these. He says, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers with me of grace. Verse 19 says, For I know this will turn out to my, for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Chapter 2 and verse 25 he says this about Epaphroditus, Yet I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. But your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. And he uses and looks at Epaphroditus as one, and he recognizes he is one of you, Philippians, and he was sent here to me by you to carry a gift to me, and I'm sending him back, but, but, but he's your messenger. And he's one that you sent to minister to me. So if, even in sending Epaphroditus in his ministry, Paul, I believe, views that as a part of the Philippians' partnership. And we go on down in verse, uh, verse chapter 4 and verse 3. And I, I think it was, uh, uh, Pat, I know it was Pastor Fredrickson who used this example. And, I, and, I, and he pointed out something I thought was very interesting and very good. It says in verse 3, he says, um, uh, you know, we, we know about Neodi and Syntyche, and they were having some problems. And, and it says, verse 3, I urge you also, true companion, help these women. And I have this underlined in my Bible, who labored with me in the gospel. Now, he's talking about some conflict here. He's talking about some disunity, and he wants who he calls true companion to come in and, and help. But the point that, that, that Pastor Fredrickson pointed out is that these were part of his team. We're not sure what part, but they were fellow workers. They were a part of, of Paul's ministry. And, and we can't get beyond that. He viewed them as part of what he was doing. Uh, chapter 4 and verse 10, and we've read this, he said, But I rejoice in the Lord. He said that now at last uh, your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Um, Paul saw that their care had flourished again for him. And he recognized them as part of his team. And uh, we find that Paul viewed uh, the Philippians as being a part of what he was doing. But there's another side of this. I, I, I don't want us to just view this as Paul is recognizing their resources. And recognizing that they were good enough to send Epaphroditus to help him out and to, to, to bring a gift to him. I want us to understand something else that... Not only was that happening, the actual physical aspect of Epaphroditus going to Paul, the actual physical aspect of money changing hands or, or some type of, of help changing, changing hands, but to understand that Paul understood what was happening that it was that God was working in this church and using them in the furtherance of the gospel. God was at work. Chapter 1 and verse 19, fire, fire yourself back there and just kind of, we are going to settle in our text here a little bit more. But in, in 119, I just read it, it says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Christ Jesus. So it's your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Christ Jesus, both working together, both working together. Uh, in the life of the Apostle Paul, directly in the life of the Apostle Paul. Chapter 2 and verse 30, about Epaphroditus, chapter 2 and verse 30, he's talking about uh, Epaphroditus was sick, um, uh, uh, almost died, verse 27, but God had mercy on him, and, and God also had mercy on, on Paul as well. Verse 28 says, Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, uh, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, 
and hold such a man in esteem. And I just, I just want to point this out, verse 30, because for the work of Christ, he, became, he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what it was lacking in your service toward me. That, that statement, because of the work of Christ. Did, did Epaphroditus have an assignment? Yes. Did he have a purpose? Uh, yes. Did he do an act of service? Yes. But Paul says it's because of the work of Christ. We can't lose this fact that God is at work in this situation. God is at work in these actions, in these acts. It's not just a check that you sign and put in the offering plate. God works through us. It's not just the fact that, yes, I have to show up early or I show up early to church to set up the chairs or to make the coffee. We need to realize that God uses that to, to support the body of Christ. Uh, verse 10, as, as uh, we read uh, in, in chapter 4, verse 10, we won't read the whole verse, just read the first line. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last who cares? What, was, what does that say? It says that Paul recognized what? It was God at work. Don't get caught up necessarily in what was happening specifically, although that was important and Paul identifies it as such, and we'll look at that further. But, but understand this. He saw those the Philippian church as partners in what God had called him to do, and he also saw that it was God using them and working through them. They were instruments. They were instruments in his hand. We cannot miss this, what I call, and you might have a better term for it, a divine partnership. And I believe it's a divine partnership with every believer. It's not just the Philippian church. It's every believer that names the name of Jesus Christ, that knows Christ as Savior, that is part of the family of God. God desires to use us in a divine partnership as instruments in his hand. But, but I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't know what to do. I don't, I'm not trained. I asked this student in chapel uh, some time back, you know, what are, what are, why do people, uh, what keeps people from serving the Lord, I think was the question. And then their first question is not trained enough. Uh, you know, their fear of failure. And listen, I believe in training. That's what I do. I think that that's essential. Um, not, not, I'm, I'm scared. And, and one of them is, you know, it's, 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 it's uncomfortable. And we've heard this statement of stepping out of our comfort zone, right? Um, I thought about that. And, and I thought about it maybe a little deeper. And I think there's another issue here. It's not comfort zone. It's control zone. When I step out of my comfort zone, I give up control. That's why it's so hard. I give up control. Listen, in my comfort zone, and when I'm comfortable, I am in control. I, I don't have to worry because I know. I know what's coming. I know what to do. Anything we do, you know, if we feel comfortable, because you know, we, we, we've been there, we know what to do. But when we step out of our comfort zone, we have to give up control. And I believe God's calling us to do that. To step out and say, God, I'm not God. You are. Right. And, and I want to be available to you. And I want, to, I want to stammer through the gospel if I can. And listen to this. I believe that every Christian who knows Christ as their Savior, if you know Christ as Savior, you're a Christian, born again Christian anyway, I believe that every one of you and me has the capacity to lead somebody to Christ. You do. Just tell them what happened to you. We get so worried about how do I tell my testimony. Listen, your testimony really isn't about you. Your testimony is about what Christ has done for you. Right. So anyone can do that. God wants us to simply to be available and faithful. And uh, we, I just don't want us to miss this divine partnership. This last year at, at Bring My Institute, um, our uh, theme was found in, in Philippians chapter 2. Turn there. Uh, I spoke to the senior hires on this, this passage here. And, uh, I promise you you won't hear this again, so I won't stay in it. But, but I have to go there. And this, again, is a perfect example of that divine partnership. Um, verse 12, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence. One of the things I pointed out there is, is it's easy to be a Christian at church. 
It's easy to dress nice and talk the right way, but when we're by ourselves or out there in the world, or, you know, sometimes it's a little more difficult. But he says, I want you, to, as you have obeyed in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Um, and it's been preached on this week, and I'm not going to go into great detail. And then he goes on, he says, you, believer, Philippian, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And then the very next verse, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. He says, step out and God will work. Not your own salvation with fear and trembling. God uses us if we will step out of our comfort zone. Something else in the life of the Philippians is we find out that there was there was not only different aspects that Paul used, like uh, talked to them about disunity. He talked to them about um, uh, their negative. There was some uh, bad teaching uh, about the flesh and circumcision in chapter three. He talked to them about what was happening in his, in his imprisonment, a number of things. But he also, in chapter 1, verses 28 and 29, he talks about what? He talks about their, um, their uh, um, the trials that they were going through. He says, he says uh, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which to them is a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For, it is, for to you it has been granted or given on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Where am I going with that? And I'll just say it simply, as Paul demonstrated in his life. Um, this divine partnership also uh, goes to our trials and tribulations. God wants to use us. God wants to use what we've gone through for his glory. He doesn't take us through that just as a good thing. I mean, we do some really dumb things. We do some things that aren't of God, and they get us into a lot of trouble. But God can use that. All things work together for good. You know the verse? Romans 8.28. You know, we like Romans 8.28, and I love it. Because that's another one of those God at work verses. Uh, in all things. But you know what? The answer to, to, to Romans 8.28 is 8.29. That's the why. So that we can be, we are born to the image of His Son. He allows those things to happen. And He works in those things to happen. And as uh, Pastor Ken said, he, it's like that big rock. And He's chipping away everything that doesn't look like Christ. He uses that. And he works in our lives. This last two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I went down and I spoke at a camp in the south. In Alabama, my hometown my home uh, area and hometown. And um, I'm, I'm, I was their speaker, spoke at a couple of churches, and I'm sitting there getting ready, you know, so got, probably an hour before the session, and this woman sits down next to me. I know her. I, I kind of grew up with her in youth group and so forth as a kid, a teenager, and she's my age or a little older. And we started talking, and she was telling me about, you know, you remember when, you know, when we were in youth group, yeah, yeah. You know, our family moved off to Tampa, you know, we were gone for a while and came back. Yeah, yeah. She said, well, I don't know if you knew this, but when we, got, when we went there, I, 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 got a, I got pregnant and I got an abortion. I said, I didn't know that. And uh, come to find out um, that she went, their family went there to, to, uh, to, to Tampa, moved off, and she started walking away from the Lord, and she got pregnant. She goes to her Christian mom. And, and you can imagine this young lady knowing what's right and knowing that she did wrong. Getting pregnant and having enough courage to go to her mom and say, Mom, this is what's happened. And her Christian mom, rather than being embarrassed, just told her to go have the abortion. And, and I know the mom, too. And, and I just, I, as I say that, I just shake. I'm just, I, I'm just, I, it just is sad. Well, that devastated her because she knew she did wrong and she was going to someone she could find an answer for to help her do something right for a change. And then she started spiraling. She had another child out of wedlock, gave the child up for adoption. That child, by the way, is an adult. She knows it. He's a believer. Okay, we praise the Lord for that. She has a child now from her husband and so forth. But as I sat there, I'm just, I'm just amazed. And, and, it's, and so, say, 30 years ago, 
this was happening. And she said, Robert, for the first time, I can tell somebody about it. Because now God has worked in my life in such a way that I can actually share that with someone and know that God might use it to help someone not go through what I did. Really interesting that she shared that with me. At that camp, with all these teens, some Christian, some not Christian, I sat down and I talked with a little girl. She was 12 years old. Looked like she was 25. I, I wouldn't have known she was 12, but she had told me. She said, Sarah, she said, yeah. I said, well, how are you doing? You know, do you, do you come here and go to church at, at Forest Park or Grace Church here? No, yeah, I do. I go to the kids' club or go to CBC or whatever it was. And I said, okay, does your mom and dad go? She goes, my mom and dad are, um, are in court today. Well, why is that? Well, you know, we were living with my grandparents, and they got in an argument when my grandparents and I, we were gone somewhere. My mom and dad burnt the house down. And now we're just living somewhere else. And, you know, and it's, and, you know, and it's that kind of life. Found out another little girl at the camp had been 15, 16 year old dabbling in prostitution. Whoa, that's not supposed to happen that way. What I also found out is this, that at the end of camp, they were going to get the girls together for a spa night. And this woman was going to share her story about what God had done in her life over 30 years to bring her back from all of the junk that she she faced. I don't know what kind of junk you faced. We all have our stories. And it, it could be terrible. But you realize that God can use that in some way to help someone else. You say, well, how do you know that? That seems kind of odd, kind of a stretch. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You see, I believe firmly that God uses the Word of God as the key in our lives to strengthen us, to cleanse us, to establish us, absolutely. But I also know that God uses circumstances in our lives to make us and bring us to conformity with Himself. But I also know this, that He uses circumstances. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, He says, um, blessed, or verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God uses the trials and tribulations that we go through to strengthen us if we will look to Him. When we think of that, we look at the, the, the uh, Philippian church and the persecution that they endured. We look at the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul's first missionary journey, Lystra Derby, goes in there and what? They stone him. They stone him. And then he goes on and he preaches and turns around and comes right back establishing the believers there. He gets this massive, or someone has a, there's a Macedonian vision and he tells Paul, Paul, you got to go, go to Macedonia, which is where Philippi is. And, you know, when you think if God's giving you this big directive vision, right, and God wants you to go there and he makes it clear that everything would be okay. He gets there and before long, what's happening? He's in jail. He's being beaten. And throughout his ministry there, he's being beaten and persecuted, thrown into prison. But God used it. See, God's not promising us a life of, of uh, ice cream and cake and lollipops. But He is promising us a life of usefulness if we will trust Him. I believe the Philippians are that beautiful example of, of God working through them and being a partner in a ministry, the Apostle Paul's ministry. The, uh, back to Philippians chapter 4, the second principle. I'm sorry I'm going to have to ask this, but what time do I need to stop by? Be honest. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock, okay. I don't think you told me the truth. I think it's yeah. 9.30. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, the principle number two, unless we're going to work our way through this, principle number two is this. God gives and gifts and blesses believers so they can use these blessings and gifts to serve the body of Christ. And I believe that's exactly what we have here. I'll repeat it. God gifts and blesses believers so they can use these blessings and gifts to serve the body of Christ. 
I want to say this about that young lady I mentioned who had gone through that 30 years ago. She was also currently being trained to be a pro-life counselor at the time. So she was using, um, God was going to use her in that way. And uh, we praise the Lord for, for God's usefulness and God's grace. We absolutely do. Um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 15, we find that, that these believers were being used, their gifts and abilities were being used by God to support the Apostle Paul. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, uh, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning the giving and receiving, but you only. Thank you, but you only. The Philippian church, in verse 15, used the resources they had for the cause of Christ. They used their resources to further the gospel of the grace of God. Verse 16, as we read on down, for even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. They gave more than once to the Apostle Paul. An ongoing commitment to the furtherance of the gospel of the grace of God. They continued to give. They continued to support his ministry. Verse 18, and I am skipping verse 15 for a reason, or 17, we'll go back to it. Indeed, I have all in abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, acceptable and, and acceptable sacrifice, sacrifice well pleasing to God. They gave of themselves through the ministry of Epaphroditus as well as their financial means. I did a little research, and I know it's not exact, but my research, my cursory research, found that from Philippi to Rome was roughly 600 miles one way. Their cars were not as fast as ours now. <laughs> Guys, that's, that's a commitment. That's a commitment. It's a commitment for me to drive my car 600 miles. It's a commitment. But to walk it, to ride a horse, to ride a boat, to do everything it took, to carry money that, that, that people were out there robbing and people were out there, you know, there were people out there that were looking to do wrong and looking to steal. And Epaphroditus was a committed man, a trusted man. It took something. It took something. I, I don't think that they, they chose Epaphroditus just uh, because he could breathe. I think that they chose him because he was a trusted messenger. But you see, God gifts and blesses believers so that they can use these blessings and gifts for the support of the body of Christ. We find out, we read already in chapter 2 and verse 30 about Epaphroditus, that he, he wasn't regarding his life. Why? For the work of Christ. It reminds me of Onesiphorus in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, where it just simply says, He was not ashamed of my chains. Paul was not a popular man in the culture. He wasn't someone you had to be seen with. Or you wanted to be seen with necessarily. But God had done a work in their lives. So much so. That they were willing to sacrifice. And give what they, of what they had. And send someone they trusted. To carry that out. And to minister to the Apostle Paul. Paul tells us. And I want you to do this. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul tells us that they weren't a wealthy church. Boy, that shoots some of us down, doesn't it? Well, I don't have that kind of money, and you know, and you know, I just can't do that. And Paul uses the church there in Philippi and the churches in Macedonia as an example here. I just want to read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 and following, and just follow along. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. That's uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 1. That in, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in riches of their liberality. 
For I bear witness according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Implore, and I like this, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive. Take it, take it. The gift and the fellowship of ministering to the saints. And, and not only as we had hoped, but they first, and folks, and this is the key. This is the key. This is the highlighted portion that you need to look at. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. They weren't giving it because they just had plenty and it was something nice to do so they could feel some, feel, feel some philanthropic you know, joy of just giving to make themselves feel better. They were being moved by the Spirit of God to give. And they responded to give to the Apostle Paul. They first gave themselves to the Lord. Chapter Romans, since we're going that direction, head back to Romans chapter 12 and verse 8. I, be, I honestly believe that... These, these people were so blessed by what God had done through Paul in their lives and the change and the assurance and hope that they had as a result of his ministry. That they just were rejoicing in the Lord. And as a result of rejoicing in the Lord, they wanted to meet the needs and they could do that. Not because they were wealthy, because they were led by the Spirit. Chapter 12, verse 8 says something really interesting, and some of you may not agree with this, and that's, that's okay. There's plenty of room for disagreement. Um, in, in, when Paul lists the gifts here in, in chapter 12 of, of Romans, and I believe that they're gifts for the body of Christ, he does mention prophecy, and, uh, and I agree that the revelatory gifts are not for today since we have the Word of God. Um, but let's just look, look at this. He says, having then gifts differing according to the grace given to us, let us use them in prophecy, let us prophecy in proportion to our faith of ministry, let us use our, in, in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, and he who exhorts in exhortation, and he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And the, the, the uh, old King James, I mean, even new King James here, uses the phrase, um, I believe, simply or in simplicity, is that right? Is that right? Yeah. And, and I was just looking at that, and I'm just trying to look at and, and kind of get a feel, because it is translated differently in the New King James of liberality. Um, but I believe he's talking about a gift of giving. I, I believe it's in the list. It, you know, and I think that he, he not, you know, please understand this, I believe he calls every believer to give. But I do believe that they're special. God uses people specially and, and blesses them specially to give. And, and, and this idea of, of, of simply or, or in simplicity, or, or, or I believe the idea is, is, is more so of a purity of giving. It's not a show. One, trend, one commentator says the idea is possibly from a pure heart and privately. And I like that because, it, because it's not someone who's walking around saying, look what I've got. It's the person who the Lord has blessed, and as a result of his blessing, and I mean monetarily blessing in their lives, through business or whatever, they, the Lord has moved them to give, and they give. I've been involved in churches where pe I've seen people like that. And you wouldn't know them. They don't walk around like that with the gold chains and cufflinks, and you know, and the... And they don't, and they don't necessarily drive Mercedes or whatever, but boy, God has blessed them and overwhelmingly blessed them. Right. And they write a check for $10,000, or they give stock to something, or they, and you, you know, and you don't never know it, and all of a sudden there it is. I believe God does bless people that way, and I believe God uses people that way. I, I will say this He wants every one of us. To be, to be a cheerful giver. We'll look at that passage in a moment. But I also believe that he uses people that he is blessed in a great way. Paul said he knew how to be content when he was hungry and also when he was full. 
And I, I know I'm paraphrasing that. And someone, I think, said it today, maybe it was Pastor Wallgast, that not only is it hard when you don't have, but I think it's difficult for people who are wealthy to let go. But you know what? When it's the Lord leading, it's amazing what happens. But it's only the Lord. It's not out of manipulation. Please, I, I'm just, I want you to know that. And it's, it's where he leads you. To, to give and to be a part of. And, and, and I just, I just, am, I believe that God uses, and I, I want to repeat this principle because I believe it's there. God gifts and blesses believers so they can use these blessings and gifts to serve the body of Christ. I believe that involves singing as well. It's not here. I don't think the context talks about singing back in Philippians. But if God's gifted you in that way, use it. If it's teaching, use it. Because I think God has a purpose for each one of us. Let's go back to our text in Philippians. Principle number three, and I, I did skip verse 17 because I want to go back here. It's a, one of those verses that you have to take a double take at. I'll read verse 16, 17, just in, in tandem here, as our, our, in, in, in order. Um, for in Thessalonica, even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift. And I, I think this is important. I think Paul wanted to convey, and he does it a couple different times. He talks about contentment. I think, I really believe that he wanted them to realize that it wasn't about the money. I think he realized, I think he wants to let them know he appreciated that. It was real. He needed it. But, but I think there was something bigger here. It could cause Paul to say, I rejoice in the Lord for what he was doing. But in verse 17, he says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Oh. What does he mean? Well, read it again. Not, that's funny, I hate these dumb glasses. I said, I, I put them all look in the mirror and I go, oh my Lord, there's my dad. <laughs> um, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. I believe, and this is principle number three, that we please God as we, as we, as we uh, step out in faith and we follow the leading of God. We please God and are given eternal rewards when we give to his work. Amen. I think that's what he's talking about. Amen. I believe he's talking about a reward. I, I, I believe he's talking about the, a re eternal reward here. Not that I seek a gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. We are told a number of places too, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, about the judgment seat of Christ. Well, there will be rewards lost and there will be rewards received. And I believe that's exactly what he talked about. Somebody talked about the idea of leading someone to Christ and having a part of that, being at the judgment seat of Christ and having that as a reward. I believe that's the case. And rewards are a little sketchy for me. I know some people have done great studies on them. I'm not sure that, 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 that we we're told enough to do huge studies on what exactly they are and to enumerate them. We don't, I don't know that. I know that God, from this verse... He tells us that there is a fruit that abounds to our account. And he's using it here in the context of, of this church who gave monetarily to his ministry. Here Paul is declaring that the Philippians would be rewarded based on their partnership in the ministry. Whenever we partner with others in the ministry, we are working together to see that that ministry is accomplished. Whether it is is a school, a missionary, another ministry, your local church, as God moves on our hearts, we are declaring that um, that He wants us to be part of that ministry, and He lays it on our hearts to do so. Um, I, over my years, I, I was in youth work for a long time, youth ministry, and and I, I now my wife and I. Get, get support letters from teenagers and other people going on mission trips. How many of you get those? All right. 
We can't give to all of those, and we don't. But when we feel led to do so, I love it. You know why? Because I'm not going to Africa in a month. But if I can help that person go, I am partnering with their ministry. And when they lead a person to the Lord in Kenya or Haiti or somewhere else, I'm a part of that. I want to be a part of that. God is using me and, and like the Philippians and like he uses you as a partner, an extension of that ministry. That's why when I said something about BBI earlier, when I look at Pastor Paul Turner or Pastor Matt Ritchie or Pastor Kevin Sadler, others, uh, Justin, all these others, the missionaries that go out as a result of the ministry of the school, it's as a result, their training comes from the school that we're very happy about that, we're encouraged about that, we want to do it well, but it, when you start breaking it down, our partners are huge. It's not just the teachers. We're partners in this. When I get a support letter that says support this missionary and I feel led to do that, and we give to that, God is using that. And I believe he's talking about a reward. I'm not talking, and I think we can get really weird on that because we start thinking, if I get this, I'll get a reward. And I think that's probably one that just got burned up. But we start trying to manipulate God. I, I just feel like when he says this, he's saying that it's, it's, there's a greater purpose and and God uses it. I believe, um, and I, I will say this before I'll go on to my next point. Um, if God is leading you, respond. Period. Forget giving. If God is leading you, respond. If it's giving, give. If it's going, go. If it's speaking, speak. And he'll work through you. And he'll work through me. Principle number four, look at, look at verse 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Principle number four is what I was told by a couple of different people in my life. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. Paul lets the Philippians know, and I believe us as well, that God supplies our needs. Plain and simple. This is not a manipulation verse. This is not a late night tele-evangelist verse that simply says if you give a hundred dollar, you know, faith promise gift, you'll get two hundred dollars back. Listen, we are naked and laid bare before God. He sees our hearts. And I'm not even saying that he supply, will necessarily supply monetarily. But I believe he can. <coughs> I believe he can. We're almost done. I want you just to simply go to, go to, go to 2 Corinthians chapter, <coughs> chapter 9. Let these verses speak for themselves. God meets our needs. <coughs> He blesses us. Talking to the Corinthians using the Macedonians as an example of challenging it in the, the, the Corinthians in their giving. Verse 6 of chapter 9, and forgive me, I'm jumping right into the context. I encourage you to go back and read it. Um, because it's loaded with, with, it's actually loaded with good teaching on giving, good principles on giving. But verse 6, he says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. 
I don't choose to spiritualize that, although I do believe it has spiritual applications as well. I believe God supplies, and God can supply. I honestly believe you cannot outgive God. I believe that when we are led by the Spirit of God to give, He makes up for that somehow. And it may be just simply the blessing of giving and the joy of being a part. It may be that reward that we talked about. But it says, my God shall supply your needs. And I know specifically he's talking to the Philippians, no doubt. But I believe there's a greater message here, and that's that God supplies needs. My needs. Your needs. Finally, principle number five takes us down to a verse that really is Paul closing out. But I wanted to bring it out in verse 22. Principle number five is this. God